Welcome. Welcome. We are celebrating the end of Advent together. And I'm kind of intrigued with the way it, it uh, landed in this series that we've been in. And so what I want you to do, if you got some Bibles with you, or a phone, or a scroll, Genesis 15. That's where we're going to start tonight. And if you have a scroll, I'm wildly impressed. All right, let's read this, and we'll hop in together. Genesis 15, verses 12 to 18. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation that they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors, Abram, in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed, passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. Tonight, we are tying a pretty Christmas bow on this series that we've been in the last couple months called An Invitation to the Spiritual Disciplines. We've been on this journey exploring practices like worship and prayer, Sabbath and celebration, fasting and stewardship and listening, amongst a few others along the way. And tonight we're landing in the discipline or the practice that I see as the discipline that has infused itself throughout each week of this series. The Bible calls it waiting on the Lord. I find it utterly beautiful that we are celebrating the coming of our King and his promise to us by landing the year and waiting on the Lord. It's one of the most prominent golden threads throughout the entire narrative of scripture is God promises a brilliant future for Israel to Abraham. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But it is only in the, at the end of the Bible in Revelation that we see that promise fully realized. And who knows when that day actually is, right? We are still expectantly waiting on that day. So at the end of 2022, as you and I stand here, getting all of our 2023 personal and business goals ready, as we are believing that this is going to be the best year yet, like we all said in 2020, and as we are prepping our New Year's resolutions that we will utterly cave under the pressure of no later than January 19th, according to some scientist on some internet website, all the while that that's going on, you and I are still wrapped up in this great pregnant waiting that began with Abraham and was assured in Jesus, but will only be completely fulfilled when the bride of Christ, the church, welcomes Jesus again to earth to make his throne here as it is in heaven. But until then, you and I and all of creation are waiting on the Lord. That's where we're going tonight. And this is such a Bible idea, right? Waiting on the Lord. By uh, essence, it, it, it is foolishness to anyone who doesn't walk with God, who waits on the Lord. If you don't believe in God, okay, that's, that's foolish. But the reality is, is people would beg. Like, you get one life, one life. Are you going to wait around and sit on your hands? Or are you going to go make something of it for yourself? Are you going to go make something of it for the people around you? But I hope tonight to bring a joy and a beauty 
to the practice of waiting on the Lord. Because it is <laughs> wildly subversive. And it is far more powerful than we could imagine because this is the great hope that we have as followers of Jesus. That the world as you and I see it now, it's not just on some fatalistic trend towards destruction. However it may look right now, it's not, there's not nobody or nothing to intervene, but we have a hope in the restoration of all things. That's our hope as Christians. And this all things, it includes your life. It includes my life. You can have a different ending than the beginning of your story. Who you are, the decisions you've made, the person you've become, God's not finished writing that story. Your past doesn't have to be the picture of your future. There is healing, there is hope, there is restoration, and there is Jesus who is writing a story of redemption and restoration over you and the entire cosmos. All right, you guys are like not stoked or something. <laughs> That's pretty freaking good news. <laughs> oh man. What? Yeah, just soaking it in. If I, could ex if I could put a phrase to the last few years of my life, the last few seasons of my life, I should at least say, and I'll just, I'll add, I asked Chris if I could preach on waiting on the Lord, because it is the descriptor that I would use to explain not the past couple of years, but past couple of seasons of mine and Haley's life. And you could look at our life and, and you could look at any life in here and be like, come on, what are you guys waiting for? You're very blessed. Yes, absolutely. But Haley and I truly feel that there is a mission and moment for our, our life that God has called us to but he has not called us to, or has not called us now to go accomplish it and do it. He's asked us to wait and to ready ourselves. And maybe tonight, that's where you're at. You're in a season of just waiting and readying your life. But I hope that you're encouraged tonight. I hope that you remember tonight that God is still moving and is still working when we celebrate Advent, we remember Emmanuel, God with us. That the reality of his presence and the possibility of his presence would encourage you that he is still on track to accomplish his plans, his purposes, and his promises. Pete Gregg wrote a book called How to Pray. It is as simple and straightforward as it sounds. And if you are not a mystic like me, you'd love it. I mean, I'm not a mystic. If you're not a mystic like I'm not a mystic, you would love it. <laughs> but he points out that, that <clears throat> the Bible tells us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all of our mind. But we really typically only use half of our mind to love, to love God. And it's the left side of our brain where we simply have this constant stream of words and thoughts. Prayer simply becomes this rational processing of God. But to sit in his presence and wait on him, I mean, that is almost unimaginable, if not impossible. Now, if some of you in here are urban monks, forget about everything I'm about to say. But for the rest of us, most of our Western modern lifestyle is revolved around removing waiting from our lives. So in all fairness, like the cards are quite stacked against our favor, right? What once took weeks, then revolutionarily days to send a letter in the mail, now you can send that same letter across the world in microseconds through text or email. We can warm up our food in a matter of seconds in the microwave. We don't have to wait for a warm and sunny day to dry our clothes. In fact, in 30 minutes, you can have those warm, cozy garments back up against your skin. And as I'm saying that, I'm just thinking, 
Doesn't 30 minutes actually sound like a long time now? Like, I, I think we should probably be ahead of that at this point. <laughs> Haley and I, uh, just today, eight and some change months pregnant, decided we're going to move um, our whole life to a new place. And it's uh, very exciting. And I'll tell you, do you know what my second favorite thing about it is? It has a dishwasher. <laughs> it has this little white box that I can go and eat anything I want. I put my dirty plates in there. I walk away and forget about them. And I come back and they're clean. At least I think that's how it works. And I don't think it unloads stuff back into the pantry, but I'm losing my mind about it right now. Do you know what my favorite thing about this new place is? Ready yourself. Someone might have just said it. It has in-unit washer and dryer. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't have to take 10 steps out of my door and pay $1.50 to wash or dry my clothes anymore. So to all of my homies here who I can tell have been scrumming the apartment lifestyle with me for the last 10 years, your boy made it. I made it. I am starting the in-unit laundry life today, and I never, ever plan to go back. Ever, Lord help me. <laughs> we can hardly wait two days for an Amazon package, two minutes for a Snapchat, let alone two seconds for a look at our phones. And it's funny and wildly disturbing all at the same time, most definitely, but even our incessant need to fidget, it just doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. It's much deeper. How are we supposed to abstain from the fleshly lust that war, that wage war against our souls, as Peter says? Or like Paul says, how are we supposed to have the endurance to press on and take hold of the victory that Christ has won for us? How can you and I watch our country take partisan sides about which lives matter more? How can we watch nations war against nations while we have no power, not an iota of power to go and change the situation? Even with how little waiting we have to do in our lives, the deep cry that calls to deep for rest and peace of mind and sanity is multiplying infinitely. Depression and anxiety, they're not even prominently endemic amongst younger generations, but all generation. And the, 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 the thought of any sort of idleness that could cause us to trip into the world of our own thoughts itself is agonizing. So wait on the Lord. What do you mean wait on the Lord is even there? Because you've prayed and he hasn't answered. You've asked and you haven't seen. And when we look at the global scale headlines, they seem to trend much more towards hell than heaven. So I'm not even sure that waiting on the Lord only sounds ludicrous to the unbeliever. But even to the believer who says they put their hope in Jesus, even you, there are certainly doubts swirling around in your head. And I don't mean to start tonight like all doom and gloom, I am not typically a world is on fire, prophet of doom kind of person at all. In fact, I think nine times out of ten, there's a far more uh, creative way to, to start a sermon. And I do believe that God is up to far more redeeming works in this world than the enemy is. However, I'm also wildly aware that the very soil, the soil that we stand on since the moment God spoke it into existence has been battlegrounds between good and evil, between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And even now we're watching that play out on national and global scales. So to simply sit by and wait 
It sounds remarkably irresponsible, if not evil itself. Are you just going to watch it happen? But in light of all of that, my problems start to seem really small. My house, my job, my salary, traffic on the 405, business plans and goals, personal plans and goals. In perspective, it all just seems really small. And yet we carry the tension of both as we wait on the Lord. That God has promises and purpose and plans for all of creation. And God also has promises and plans and purpose for your life. We carry the tension of Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord. You know when I sit. You know when I rise. You know a word on my tongue before it even comes out. But also we we sit in the tension of Psalm 24 that the earth, all of the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He created it on its foundations. He laid it on its, on this, he established it on the seas. And so I know no better story of personal promise and eternal promise. A better story of waiting than the story of Abraham and the story of Israel. And so if you still have your Bibles open, just flip a couple pages back to Genesis 12. That's where this whole story begins. This, friends, is the promise. This is the promise that God spoke over Israel and that we are still a part of today. We are still, 2022, still Waiting on today. All right. It's on the screen as well, if you'd like. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old and he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And here it is. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. This is the promise that helped the Israelites endure through hundreds of years of slavery, through 40 years in the desert, violent wars, terrible kings, that one day God would establish them in a land, in safety, to be a witness to God and a blessing to the nations around them, blessing to the world. And so you turn the page, expecting the the, the story to just burst forward in the drama of Israel outnumbering the stars of the skies, blessing the nations, laying the foundation stones of their burgeoning land. But instead, you read this, and I really couldn't think of any other word other than this embodied drama of deception and destruction and death, but also redemption, But this man, Abraham, is amazing. And there's something so clearly different and powerful about him. But he and his people also, wildly, botch the plan sometimes. And instead of laying the foundation stones on their land, they're raising livestock and growing crops on leased and foreign land. You with me? You comprehending? A few chapters later, God makes this promise. We started reading it earlier. And uh, 
I'll just, I'll just read it back over to you guys. He makes this promise with Abraham, and he, he, the, the, the essence of it is, Abraham, I'm going to do this, not by your strength, but by my strength. And here's what he says to him. Know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. We should read that and be like, excuse me, huh? This sounds like the old bait and switch, God, right? When, when you and Abraham were talking earlier, you were going to bless him and his, na- and his family and make them a great nation, and they were going to be a blessing to the world. There was none of this slavery talk going on. And now Abraham's left. He's followed the Lord on his word. He has gone into the wilderness, into the unknown. And God says, yep, for 400 years, they're going to be slaves. The nation that's supposed to be a blessing to the world. And we're like, is that your great plan, God? Is that really it? And God's like, yes, it is. But don't worry. I will punish that nation and they will leave with a lot of possessions. And we're like, "Um, okay, (laughs) great. Oh, by the way, Abraham, you'll be dead. What? What is, why am I doing all this then? It, it is quite an interesting turn of events when you go from Genesis 12 to Genesis 15. And it's not even until Genesis 23, when Sarah dies, that Abraham, and, and by default Israel, owns any land at all. It's, he just buys a, uh, like a plot of land to bury his wife. This doesn't really have the echoes of the great promise of Genesis 12 that we recently read. In fact, Abraham and Sarah both die with very little to show for the, comp- the fulfilled promise of God. And so you keep reading through Genesis and you read the story of his sons, um, Isaac and, Ab- and Jacob, and it's like verbatim, almost the same stories. There's something going on here. It's this embodied drama of good and evil. But ultimately, Genesis does land in a really hopeful trajectory Um, Jacob buys some land like his father Abraham did. And then Joseph is promoted to big time leadership in a world power named Egypt. And you're like, oh yeah, this is the story that I'm wrapped up in. I'm in that one right there. And so you open to Exodus and the Israelites are living in Egypt and they outnumber the stars in the sky, it seems. There's so many of them. And you're like, yep, God, you're doing it. Oh, but they've been slaves for 400 years. And you and I read that and we're like, yeah, I I don't really like that. That's really weird, but we did just read that. We could expect that that would happen, right? Well, try being a slave for 400 years, making bricks 18 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It might be a little bit harder to remember the promise of God. But Genesis, this is where, (laughs) this is where Abraham shows us the essence of waiting on the Lord. Here's what I find so fascinating about this. You ready? Abraham's response isn't, well, God, at minimum, we've got 400 plus years. And uh, so anything I do now is just going to be sold to slavery anyway. So, hey, why don't we just kick back and leave it to the generations after me to handle? That's not what he does. He continues to pursue the promise. He continues to cultivate the ground that produces godly character for a nation. He lives this life of chutzpah, the rabbis call it. It's this fire in his belly, this, 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 this just uh, power that just says, you know, Abraham's not your average Joe. God can make something of this guy. The story goes on and he's circumcised, devoting himself completely to the Lord. He shows generosity like we've never seen to strangers. He pleads deeply to the Lord on behalf of the nation of Sodom. He gives away 10% of everything he owns. And then there's this really disturbing story of him taking his son up the mountain, 
which we talked about a while back. It's, it's a really beautiful story, but it sounds pretty gnarly. But you can't doubt his allegiance to God. In fact, nothing is guaranteed to Abraham in his lifetime, and yet he trusts the Lord. He waits on the Lord and he pursues the promise that God spoke over him and spoke over Israel. We see a very similar kind of chutzpah in King David. Again, this is just a very embodied character, right? And on some level, we can all relate to David. He just blows it sometimes, but he's a man with a pure heart. Like he is a repentant man when he blows it. In fact, the most common use of the phrase wait on the Lord is in the Psalms, in David's writings of the Psalms. And where am I at? Sorry, I go off my notes sometimes. Wait on the Lord. It's the most common in David's writings. As he's leading the nation of Israel through war, as he's being attacked on every side, as he's betrayed by the ones who said they love him so dearly and not like you said something to hurt my feelings. No, like we are going to wage war against you. As he walks a nation through famine, through political disruption, when he sins against God, when he lies down and when he sits up, when he meditates on God's presence, when he is depressed and anxious, when he is fully in the crosshairs of the battle between good and evil, what is David's healing balm? Read Psalm 27 with me. I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart or let your heart be courageous and wait for the Lord. There was this confidence, this trust in David. The same confidence that was in Abraham to leave his country the same confidence in the justice oppressed, justice obsessed prophets, the same confidence and trust in Jesus as he bows down in the garden of Gethsemane and says, not my will, Father, but yours be done. And then as he's raised up on a cross before the world, coronated in the most unly, unlikely way as a king and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In essence, they don't know what you've promised, what you've really promised. They don't know that this has been your plan all along. Please hear me, friends. This is the essence of waiting. That biblical waiting is not a passive patience. We don't just give up until God comes through. Abraham didn't just kick back. David didn't tap out. Ruth didn't go home. Mary didn't hide away. Peter didn't let his sin knock him out. But they remained faithful to God and the assignment that he put on their lives as God remained faithful to them and to his promises. You may find yourself in a season of waiting right now. If you don't feel that way, you will. I promise. There will be a moment where you say, God, I know that there's something ahead of me that you called me to ready myself for, but it's not yet time for it. That day is coming. But as you wait, as we wait, we're called into that same chutzpah that same fire in our bellies to continue pursuing the mission that God has placed on your life. The mission that he's placed on all believers' life. And as we wait for him, and as we pursue our mission, he will fulfill what he started. Has his kingdom fully come on earth as it is in heaven? No, it hasn't. 
but we continue to love our enemies. Show mercy and patience to the stranger. Bring justice to the oppressed. Clothe the naked. We bring the hope of Jesus to the defeated, the salvation of Jesus to the lost. We pray, we fast, we ask as we wait for the king to come and his kingdom to fully arrive. Friends, waiting on the Lord is not sitting on your hands hoping God will come through soon. Waiting on the Lord is using your hands to cultivate the soil that his kingdom will take root in. It's not waiting on the Lord. Sorry, it's not sitting on your hands, but it is using your hands. Or in Paul's language, Romans 12, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I remember my junior year of college, uh, I was going through the darkest season of my life to date. I really, uh, the lights were just completely out. I had no sense of God whatsoever. In fact, I didn't even think God existed. And I was a pastor, well, I was a worship, uh, like worship leader. I was doing all kinds of stuff for church and I was like, I don't even know if you're real God. And I would just sit on the couch night after night and just moan and complain, God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? I mean, the Psalms felt real. And as I sat there and it went on and it went on and it went on for nine months, for a year, my good friend Robbie, uh, we went out on a drive to Utah, um, so a little more than a drive, a road trip, And uh, we were driving from Utah to the Grand Canyon. And he just said to me, he said, Tyler, how do you expect, like you're praying, you're sitting here asking God to do something in front of you so that you'd know he's real. But how do you expect to see him at work if you're just sitting in your living room every night? How do you expect to see him moving amongst the people in powerful ways if you're just confined to your little box? How, and, and probably the, the piece that felt like the biggest slap in the booty was like, how, how do you expect him to show you when you know that you know that you know that he has called you to be an activist? He's called you to be somebody who stands up for the oppressed, for those under injustice, and yet you're just sitting on your couch. Like that's how God wants to use you. That's how he wants to show himself to you. And that was that slap from the butt and the, from the coach that I needed just to get back in the game and play. And I stand as a testimony that as I got up off that couch and my life was still in shambles, joy, I I love the verse that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Like I did not have joy getting off the couch, but I, I know that the joy of the Lord gave me strength to get off the couch, to believe that there was more, to hope for more. And as I did, friends, the lights turned back on. I started seeing God move again, not just in my life, but in the people around me. And he restored a hope in my life again. And so maybe like me, you're in a moment where you just can't see God. You can't even sense God. The lights are out and it's dark. Or maybe you're in a season of simply hoping that there's more for your life than just this. Maybe God's called you to the nations, but you're in Costa Mesa. Maybe you hate your job and God has put a passion on you to serve his people in another way. Are you trying to pull yourself out of bed every morning, but depression is just holding you there? Do you struggle to even dream about the future because it's just filled with anxiety? Are you praying and believing for healing, for financial provision, for emotional restoration? Are you waiting on wars to end? Unity in our nation. Jesus, to come back. Unity and healing. Healing in our nation. And Jesus to come back and take his throne. Unity and healing and forgiveness in our nation. 
and for Jesus to come back and take his throne, then may I remind you tonight that this is not the end. What we see now, what's on the horizon is momentary. And as we're waiting on God, God's not absent in our waiting. Remember that we're waiting for his promise, not waiting for his presence. And, and during these times, we always, we stay near to God. We hold to him in our waiting because we need him. We need him. And so Genesis, how do we become a people of waiting? until that great day when we usher Jesus to earth again. I want to land with two pieces here, and then we are going to come to the table together. I think of Paul's writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and he's talking about how he's heard of their great faith from all kinds of places. And here's what he said to them. I think this is a scripture that we have in there. He says, we've heard how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. That's a longer conversation, but a really beautiful conversation. So how do we wait? As the Thessalonians show us, how do we wait? Well, we turn from the powers of this world and of the unseen realm and we give our that have our attention and that have our worship and we give it to God and we serve him. We give him our lives unconditionally. Oh, I just hit my 10,000 steps. How about that? <laughs> we give him everything. And, and, and as we're doing that, we continue the mission that he's placed on our life to make earth look a lot more like heaven through our presence and through our actions and our sacrifices and our generosity and in our preaching. Genesis, could we be so courageous not to simply be passive as we wait on the Lord? And we also have this wonderful body of truth in the spiritual disciplines that we've been practicing for the, or practicing and preaching on for the last few months together. And uh, the very essence of the spiritual disciplines, they place us in positions of humility and obedience as we wait on the Lord. To let God be God and me be his trusting child. To surrender and to submit to his ways, to his will, to his timing. And so some of them that we've practiced, and you can put the first on the screen, um, Dallas Willard in The Spirit of the Disciplines talks about two types of disciplines, disciplines of abstinence and disciplines of engagement. And so we practice as we wait things like silence and solitude. These place us before the Lord and let our ears be tuned to his voice. We practice fasting, that it's, it's your word that will sustain me, God, not bread alone. My life, it's not my will, Lord, but yours be done. We practice frugality and chastity, secrecy. Your name be great, Lord, not, not mine. Sacrifice my time and my plans and my ideas all bow to yours. Then there's also these disciplines of engagement, where we position ourselves actively as we study, we give time to the word, to culture, to become biblically literate people, to know the world that we're ministering into. Worship, as we've been doing this whole time, that his name would be lifted highest in our lives. Celebration, to ready ourselves for the great wedding feast that we will share when he returns. Service, we bring the kingdom to earth through our actions. Prayer, because we need his guidance. We need his presence. And we need his strength as we wait. All of these practices teach us that God is not distant nor silent, but that he knows you, 
that God loves you. He knows your needs. He knows your daily bread. He has not forgotten. He is enough. He will give us everything we need. But they also remind us that God is above all of creation. That the systemic evil that has weaved itself into and out of our lives and has abused the innocent and the poor and the oppressed, it is not. That evil is not the picture of our future. God promised to Abraham He continued it through Jesus that there is a future where all evil and all pain will be distant memories and restoration and healing and joy and kingdom will be our eternal reality when he arrives again. And Jesus is coming back. It's the great hope that we remember, even now in Advent, as we remember when he came at first, that Jesus is coming back to restore all things. So Genesis, wait on the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous and wait on the Lord. We're going to come to the table now to celebrate, and the worship team can come get ready to lead us a bit more. But we're going to come to the table where we remember the essence of Emmanuel, God with us, who came to restore all evil to kingdom, all brokenness to healing through his presence and also through his coming again. And so as we break the bread, we remember the entire weight, the blow of our sin that Jesus took on him as it broke his body. But we also remember the blood that he poured out to atone and to forgive and to promise eternal restoration. And so as we worship, we're going to just come up and we usually do it in rows. And um, I'll just invite you up row by row. You can kind of just watch the people in front of you, but come and take. And I pray that tonight as you receive the body and blood of Jesus, as you remember his first coming, that God would again raise a hope and an expectancy in you as you wait on the Lord for him to come again and restore all things. Let me pray and we can share communion and worship together. Jesus, we love you so much. We recognize that we can be impatient people. Like the Israelites in slavery for 400 years and the desert for 40 years, how easy it can be to forget your promise. The promise you began with Abraham, that you continued through Jesus and the promise that you will fulfill as we share in the great wedding feast with you as you come and make your throne here on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Lord, in the waiting, would you strengthen our hearts? Would you help us be strong and courageous to continue putting our hands to cultivating the soil for your kingdom to come and take root and multiply. Lift our heads, lift our eyes to be a prophetic people who believe in a day where we will see the restoration of all things. And so we live on mission with that in mind, God. And at the same time, we celebrate these moments with heaviness on our hearts. We come to the holidays. We come even to the communion table with doubts swirling around. God, what what, what can you do about this? But you gave us Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. 
And so we hold on to his hope. We hold on to his salvation and we hold on to his promise for the redemption of all things. Come, Lord Jesus, come again. Come, Lord Jesus.